I think we're good to go here. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, this is really exciting. This is um, one of my favorite events of, of the film festival. Um, I'm Wendy Stapleton. I'm the chairwoman and founder of the Greenwich Film Festival. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all to our 2022 Social Impact Film Awards Ceremony. Um, to me, this event is really the heart of what we do at GIF and what differentiates us from other film festivals. Film opens our eyes to a different way of life and to different experiences. In just a few short hours, film can build bridges of understanding between people with vastly different life experiences. It can build empathy among individuals with a speed and a depth that only art can. Film has the unique ability to bypass bias and speak directly to the heart. At GIF, our mission is to use the power of film to educate and to inspire. And the eight films up for the award this evening do exactly that. I wanna thank the talented filmmakers who are on this call this, the call this evening for using this powerful platform to foster a more tolerant and understanding world. I'd like to thank our executive director, Ginger Stickle, for her tireless commitment to GIF since our inception, Erin uh, Pollock, our office manager, and Laura Kutnick, um, who is both a GIF board member and the chairwoman of our film selection committee this year. Um, thank you, Laura, for your countless hours that you have put into screening um, and expertly reviewing and selecting films for us. We really couldn't do it without um, all of you. So thank you so much. Uh, I also wanna give a special thank you to Ann Bresnan Young and Nick Young who have generously underwritten the Social Impact Film Award this year for the eighth time. We, your generosity and the impact this award has had through the years is deeply appreciated. Finally, I'd like to thank the jury which includes Ann Bresnan Young S. Casper Wong, my dear friend, Chris Maddox, and the head of our jury this year, Deborah Lee Furness. Deb is an internationally acclaimed actress and humanitarian. She has received the Best Actress Award from the Film Critics Circle for, of Australia twice, as well as the Variety Award. She won the Best Actress Award at the Seattle Film Festival. Deb has also worked extensively in television, including on the series Corelli, where she met her husband of 26 years, Hugh Jackman. Deborah Lee's humanitarian work is a driving force in her life. She has hosted the Global Citizens Festival since 2016, whose mission is to eradicate extreme poverty worldwide. She founded the organization Adopt Change in 2008, which advocates for the reform, um, reform in the areas of child services for adoption and foster care. She co-founded the National Adoption Aware Awareness Month in Australia and is the co-founder of Hopeland, whose mission is to build a platform for action and advocacy to benefit children globally. She is a patron of the Lighthouse Foundation for Displaced Children, the Fight, she, the Fight Cancer Foundation for Children with Leukemia, and a Goodwill Ambassador for World Vision. For her humanitarian work, she has received numerous awards, including the International Humanitarian Award, the Women of Vision Award, to name just a few. She was also named an officer to the Order of Australia, which is the second highest civilian award in Australia. Deborah is a woman who is acutely aware that she has a platform to create positive social change and has done so relentlessly. I am proud to call her my friend. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Deb, who will introduce the rest of the jury. Wendy, thank you. thank you very much. That was a long introduction. I appreciate it, darling. And congrats to you for hosting this too and for giving these, film, these films an audience. I apologize, everyone. I've just been to the dentist. They assured me the numbing would be gone by six. It's still a little there, so bear with me. I'm just having trouble with my P's and my F's. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you for the introduction. And I love working with our, my fellow jurors too. Okay, uh, I'm going to present the first one, which is Fiddler's, uh, the Fiddler's, Fiddler's Journey to the Big Screen, drawing on behind the scenes footage and never before seen stills, as well as original interviews. Fiddler's Journey to the Big Screen captures the humour and drama of Fiddler on the Roof's director Norman Jewison's quest to recreate the lost world of Jewish life in Tsarist Russia and re-envision the beloved stage shit as a widescreen epic. 
Thriller on the Roof was a global sensation both on Broadway and as an Academy Award winning film. This story still speaks to us 50 years later. And as you said, Wendy, our, using our films, hopefully it gives us empathy. I would like to see that evident now in, in this day with what's happening with Russia and the Ukraine. So I asked the filmmaker, how does this story help shed light on the plight of present, uh, present day Ukrainian refugees? Is our filmmaker in the house, Daniel? I don't see Daniel in the house right now, Deborah. Oh, no. That was a big introduction. introduction. He's not here. <laughs> it was beautifully done. I want him to shed clarity on the Ukraine for us. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, we do. Do we want to hold Daniel till the end, and we'll carry on with the rest with Anne? Yeah. Let's yeah. move on to Anne. That's a great idea. Okay, so um, uh, my synopsis is of um, a wonderful film called Young Plato, and it's about the headmaster of a Catholic boys' school in Belfast who uses the logic of great philosophers as a teaching tool in an effort to overcome the long-standing schism between Protestants and Catholics. Watching his students gradually overcome ingrained religious prejudice is a hard-won victory. We realize that one day these children will become their parents' teachers. Not surprising that when the school erects a larger than life icon, it's not a religious one, but of a thinking boy, young Plato. So for me, this wonderful film is about conflict resolution on a micro level into personal relationships, which can then be taken to a macro level, even to conflicts among nations. So I would like to ask um, the director, Nyasa Nashian, and producer David Ron, the question, how do you feel that the headmaster's amazing teaching methods can be channeled for the greater good in today's world? Thank you very much for having us here and uh, shortlisting our film. We're, we're thrilled and it's 11 o'clock at night. And as we said, we're celebrating already with a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a real pleasure. Um, I'm going to let NASA start and then I'll add in some more. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I think it's a template for any school to, to use what um, Kevin uses in his, in his school. I mean, he infuses philosophy like in everything they do. Um, and I know from showing the film to philosophical foundations in the UK, they're like, oh my God, this is what we have, this is exactly what we are trying to do in schools. This is exactly the message we're trying to get across. So I think the film itself has great impact um, potential and we're working on that ourselves uh, at the moment and working with Patricia Finneran from Story Matters and we're trying to build kind of an impact campaign. So um, when you say like, how will this, you know, I, I, I hope that this film will inspire other people to take on board what Kevin McCreevy is doing in his school and, and infuse philosophy in every aspect of the, of the, of the day, you know, of the pupils' um, school day. And um, even just simple things like the philosophy board, you know, to resolve conflict at the philosophy board. It's just such a simple thing, you know, don't punish the kids, bring them to a board and make them answer three questions. What happened? What should have happened? And where do we go from here? And by the time they've gone through that whole process, whatever conflict they were in is, is forgotten and, and they've moved on. They've, you know, they've, they've left all that behind them and, they, and they, I've seen them leave as friends every single time without fail. So, um, and we, we want to get this film out widely, obviously, and get it into community centers, youth clubs, schools, colleges, not just cinemas. And the, we had a lovely endorsement from the president of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, who wrote a letter to Kevin, the headmaster, praising him for the work he's doing in Holy Cross Boys and saying that he believes philosophy should be the cornerstone of education in in all schools everywhere and we we believe that too so that's our big picture dream is to get philosophy used and as a as a way to get children thinking about their emotions and controlling their emotions in schools all over the world especially at a very young age these are primary age children so that's what we we dream and we hope for with this film perfect thank you so much um now the next film um is called the disruptors 
And it takes an immersive look at our approach to attention deficit disorder and follows a number of families as they navigate the challenges and the surprising triumphs of living with ADHD. The tragedy of grown-ups and children forced to live with frequently undiagnosed and very disruptive neurological condition, attention deficit disorder, is largely undocumented. Since completion of your film, treatment for ADHD sufferers have become more accessible as ADHD drugs have been made widely available online. Will this be a panacea or do you feel that therapy is vital? Um, I would like to put that question to Nancy Armstrong, the producer. Thank you, Anne. Um, and thanks to the Greenwich uh, International Film Festival for making it their mission to give voice and distribution uh, with their powerful platform. You know, the film is the most powerful medium of solving, I think, social issues. And I'm very grateful to be part of this evening. So thank you. Um, well, I made this film because it had to be made and I wanted to help the millions of people with ADHD. I experienced my own struggle raising three children with ADHD, which was incredibly uh, challenging and difficult, even though I was fortunate enough to have access to experts and help, which so many people do not have. So I knew the film was badly needed. Um, and first off, to your point, Anne, adults are a largely underdiagnosed and untreated segment of the population, as are um, girls, women, and teenagers. And there is a great long-term cost to this, not only for the individual, but for society as a whole. And the issue is we have a real shortage of ADHD specialists in this country. And that's very concerning when you're talking about 10% of the population. Um, add to that a pandemic that exacerbated ADHD symptoms for children and adults, and you've got a perfect storm out of which these companies have arisen. Now, I don't know what's going to happen with these companies. I think the jury is still out on them, but, um, you know, some of them have already closed their doors. But I think the bigger point is that there's another solution to this dearth of available experts on ADHD. Pediatricians and primary care physicians need to become accredited as first lines of defense. They, can, they need certification and training, which most doctors do not have. Case in point, when my son was four years old, um, we took him to a top pediatric hospital because we were trying to figure out some issue he had um, with sensory issues. Um, unbeknownst to me, sensory issues are a symptom of ADHD, which was you know, completely off my radar at that moment. Um, so there we were in the office and my son is bouncing off the walls as he always did. And I was trying in earnest, but failing to get him to sit quietly as I always did. And the doctor comes in and has no insight as to why he's having sensory issues and looks me straight in the eye and says, I think the problem here is that your son is at war with you. And then he proceeded to do some unnecessary blood tests and sent us on our way. So it wasn't until four years later and probably half a dozen more doctors that my son was able to get a diagnosis and he's tested in the top 96th percentile on hyperactivity. So he wasn't bouncing around the room because he was willful or because I was a bad parent. He had a neurological difference that compelled his little body into constant motion. So the question you're asking is really at the heart of why this film was so needed. This film will illuminate a path forward for parents and children where there was no path. This is the film I desperately needed when I was raising three children. Um, and I also have a husband with ADHD. And I hope that it liberates children and their parents to know that they're not alone to inspire them about the strengths-based approach, which was, um, which was pioneered by Ned Hallowell and is now widely adopted by the top leading experts in the country. I hope this provides knowledge and resources and hope for a dramatically changed trajectory for these kids, especially to finally reframe this diagnosis for the world and to eradicate the stigma that is doing so much harm to so many people. So thank you, thank you for including this film and it airs on iTunes May 11th. Oh, great. Bravo. Thank you. Bravo. Thanks, sir. <laughs> so I think I'm next, right? Um, You're next. Do we, have, do we have a representative from Neon with us or should I move on to the... Okay, perhaps. 
Um, well, three minutes of lengthening is is up next, and it presents a home movie shot by David Kurtz in 1938 in a Jewish town in Poland, and tries to postpone its ending. The three minutes of footage, mostly in color, are the only moving images left of the Jewish inhabitants of Nashilsk before the Holocaust. Um, so, oh, there's Dar. Hi. Uh, so, Darcy, asking you, what have been some surprises in terms of of our audience engagement while you've been screening the film? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I am not the filmmaker. I am with um, Neon and Super, who's releasing the film, and I oversee audience engagement and impact um, for films. Um, I would say the biggest um, surprise or opportunity has been how much um, the film has been able to be an educational tool or resource um, for teachers and students. Um, we are working with um, Holocaust commissions. Every state has a Holocaust educational commission. So we're working with a number of different Holocaust education commissions across the US um, to create a curriculum um, that can be used for the film um, to get the film into middle and high school classrooms. Um, we've already done a number of screenings at different conferences. And one of the things that um, has come out of those um, conferences and also some of the screenings with students has been how much um, the themes of the film allow students to sort of connect to um, the children in the film in a different way than they might've been able to do in a textbook or hearing about it. And also, um, with these Holocaust commissions, and I have a list of them, the ones we're working with are Tennessee, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, Texas, Florida, Colorado, Arizona, and Michigan. It's not just, you know, the urban centers. It's many places. It's rural areas where students may not have an opportunity to engage with people in the Jewish community or have learned about the Holocaust in any concrete way in a classroom before. Um, so getting to see this film in an educational atmosphere and actually see, you know, young people and sort of in, you know, Europe before the Holocaust and sort of have a conversation and be able to relate to them as, you know, people um, versus, you know, history and you know, classrooms has been really, you know, powerful. Um, the other thing that has been um, a bit of an unfortunate surprise um, but um, nonetheless timely and important is where the film's been um, just naturally connected to what's happening in Ukraine right now um, in terms of particularly around, you know, what's happening to young people and children and students who've watched the film have just naturally drawn connections to the fact that, you know, right now on their screens are seeing, you know, young people in um, Ukraine, seeing their villages and their communities attacked and then they're watching this film in their classroom where, you know, 80 years ago, the exact same thing was happening and seeing, you know, what that looks like and being able to make, you know, real life connections to um, their history and real time. So those, I think, are the probably the most um, sort of surprising, but also, you know, exciting opportunities for the film to really, you know, make an impact. It's amazing. Timely and a way to educate. It's wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, next up, we have um, Mass. And just to tell you a little bit about this film, it, it, years after an unspeakable tragedy tore their lives apart, two sets of parents agree to talk privately in an attempt to move forward. Mass thoughtfully examines the parents' different journey of grief, anger, and acceptance by coming face to face with tr the traumatic impact of a murder for the parents of the perpetrator and the victim. And um, we have the film writer and director with us tonight, uh, Fran Kranz, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Uh, Fran Kranz, yeah, that's great. Fran Kranz, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, so Mass, as, as you know, very well, allows us to get a closer look on the two sides of tragedy. So my question to you, in your opinion, what does the film say about forgiveness? Yeah. Um, thank you, that's me, people. Yeah, I, you know, well, I, I I, I hope it asks you to think about it, you know, and I, I, I think because, you know, if I'm being completely honest, you know, after four years now and on the other side of this movie, um, I don't know if I'm any more capable of it, you know, I've, I've read um, so many stories 
like like what's depicted in the film. So many stories about forgiveness, so many stories of, of people or families meeting with the person or family members of the person who took someone from them. And whether or not they forgive them, or, or in many cases they forgive them, they go on to even form lasting relationships with some of these people. You see examples of real grace and, and new life after forgiveness. Um, and it's inspiring and it's, it inspired me to, to, to write this movie and make this movie and, and the, specifically as it in the, in the case of a, a mass shooting, a school shooting and the parents of, parents of uh, you know, children who lost their lives in a, shoot, in a shooting. And uh, it's inspiring, but I don't know if I could do it. I don't know if I'm any more capable of it. So I feel disingenuous, I guess, in saying what I think it says about forgiveness, if that makes sense. I mean, I do know what I want the movie to accomplish and that I want, I want to force you to think about it in your own life. And I want to force you to, to think about whether or not you're capable of it, what it provides, what it takes away. And in doing so, and in thinking about your own life, hopefully you think about it more closely as it relates to the story and then think about it as it relates to these, these, these tragedies. Because that, that, that would be, if there's any goal of the film, I want you know, you mentioned empathy to expand an audience's empathy around around this, right? And that it it it's it's no longer another parent's problem or another family's problem or another community's problem. It's all of our problems. It's all of us. And and that you know that 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 is part of my fear about society today. That it is uh, if it's not directly our problem or if it's not directly affecting us, it's not our problem. And uh, I, you know, I want to change that. I, I, I feel like it, it's on all of us and failing to see it any other way will never uh, fix anything. So that's the sort of intensity of the movie of being in you know, one room in, in real time for about 80 minutes. It's just with these four parents and sitting through the discomfort and the work of that. Um, because I think you know, in order to change the most painful or failing parts of our society, you know, we all have to shoulder that burden and and do that work and participate in that work together. So I know, God, it doesn't sound like a very fun movie. I realized, and I guess it's not, but um, that's that that that's sort of the point, you know. So anyway, thank you, thank you for the lovely introduction, and all of you. For, it's a, it's an honor to be here with you guys. So wonderful, and it's great to start the conversation. If even if we can't forgive ourselves, we can at least talk about how to maybe do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Casper, passing the baton to you. Hi, I'm Casper Wong, and I have the pleasure of introducing the movie to Olivia, and I think representing the film today is David Kennedy. Uh, the story is about the novelist Rodal and his actress wife, Patricia Neal, who lost their young daughter to complications from measles in the 1960s. Their shared grief became a source of strength and redemption. And ultimately, Dahl went on to write his children's classic, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, that would meet him a household name. And for Neil, she won an Oscar. Now, this biopic, David, um, presented at this particular moment in time during a pandemic, really highlights, I think, how our creative community um, channels some of their real life experiences. Uh, into forms of, and ignite their activism in real life. And I think both Dahl and Neil became passionate advocates for immunization right after um, and later in life as well. I would love to hear that, uh, a little bit more about that story from you. Uh, as I think, you know, I'm hearing it now from Nancy and other people in the creative community, we really do channel our passion into activism in, in, in a way that, um, uh, at least matches the moment of history. So can you talk more about that, David? Yeah, well, they were dealing with sort of an unthinkable tragedy in their personal lives. Um, and both of them were at sort of a low point creatively in their professional lives. Um, and instead of having that destroy them, uh, which it did for a period of time, they ultimately used it as fuel to go out and be advocates because they knew that they had a platform. and. They use both their artistic um, skills, but then also their platform to go out and say, you know, hey, this is a problem. This has affected us personally. We have been touched by this tragedy. 
And I think what we found as a community, you know, in the filmmaking community, the larger art, artist community, is that if you do have a platform and you have something to say that can be helpful, doing that and going out there and being helpful is, is worthwhile. And, you know, it's not easy in some cases and you might get pushback, but, you know, having that platform and utilizing it is important. But I think more to their personal lives, it was a way for them to cope. It was a way for them to work through this tragedy. And it was a way for them to ultimately get their lives together and become a family again. Uh, you know, they needed that, that thread that would tie them back. And, you know, both through advocacy and through their art, they were able to do that as a family and, and individually as artists. Yeah, thank you. I think they're not the only ones who used art as therapy, for sure. Um, uh, the second movie uh, that I'm introducing is Casablanca Beats. And joining us today, I think, is uh, Clemence uh, Talion Dia. Um, the synopsis is uh, Anas is a former rapper who's employed by a local cultural center to teach hip hop in a working class neighborhood in Casablanca. Encouraged by their new teacher, the students try to free themselves from the weight of tradition and to live their passion and express themselves through hip hop culture. Now, Clemence, I really enjoyed watching this, especially through a, the lens of someone that I don't know very well, a uh, mainly a young Muslim rapper. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like the fame story, maybe set in Casablanca, it's got a lot of the same elements. Uh, I would love to hear from you, what are the biggest challenges that you find in distributing a film like this? Yeah. Um, and how do you broaden the wide, you know, widen your audience space for, for this little gem? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for, um, you know, selecting the film and giving the film a, an, you know, an occasion to, to be seen and to be talked about. Um, so yes, uh, so first of all, just to let you know, I'm the, the distributor of the film uh, in the States and in Canada. And uh, I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm mostly doing uh, distribution of uh, foreign film documentaries. And it's always the same thing, you know, what the belief that I have, uh, that I always have is that there is, films can change uh, your state of mind a tiny bit or a lot. And this one is absolutely, uh, <laughs> has that power. That, and I believe in that power. And I also believe that there's always a hope that this film could be the next best, uh, the next big film. And we have seen that recently with the Drive My Car or with Memoria, where you see that suddenly a film that, you know, is not the, 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 the most easy uh, films to watch suddenly gets a, a huge audience. And it's always such a, a pleasure to see that. So short introduction to tell you, long introduction to, to tell you that, you know, who knows, Casablanca Beat can be a film who can have the potential of, of a, of uh, you know, impress, having an impression on an audience and trying to find the audience. So um, at this time, the film is having a, a very nice uh, uh, festival career where you know it meets its audience, it gets it gets recognized, uh, people are loving it, and we're gonna have that um, festival tour for the whole summer, pretty much, and then we are hoping we can. Um, released the film theatrically, theatrically starting in, in, um, in August. And um, the main challenge at this time, yeah, so it was not easy before the pandemic to release a foreign films. Uh, and I don't want to be too negative, but COVID did not help uh, our situation. You know, th we, there are a hun hundreds of art house screens in the United States, but right now, they're facing you know, a terrible challenge. They, they haven't had revenues for two years and now their, their audience is declining because most of their audience were more on the older um, side and they are not still ready to go to the movies. And so what they do mostly is that they are concentrating their, their programming um, into more commercial films. And so now our, you can see on our screen screening um, the next Marvel movie, which is great for them, but it's a little bit more challenging for us to find a space uh, in the movies to share our films. 
And um, so that's the main challenge. And um, um, I'm hoping that Nabil Ayush, the, the director of this film, who has done um, a, a few films before, I mean, what's what is important with the distribution, uh, theatrical distribution, is that um, the audience can recognize the filmmaker, can can become kind of loyal to the filmmaker over, you know, film after film, and that they will. That's how you can create a loyal audience to to a particular filmmaker. Maker. And so, I'm hoping that that is the first step of second second stone because we already released one of his films, and step by step. Uh, we are, we'll be able to, to, to have more and more audience gravitate uh, around his films. So that's a challenge, but it's, um, you know, every, every step at a time, every screen at a time. And uh, of course, you know, the real, the real impact that the film can have will be later after the theatrical when, when the film is available online, uh, where people can rent and buy the movies. But, um, for me, what's important is really the the um, the strength that we can give um, to the movie while it's on screen, and um, the reputation that we can give the film. So, thanks to you, and thanks to many other festivals, we are building that uh, aura, that momentum that the film needs. So. Well, thank you. Uh, we're rooting for you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Exclusive, uh, which was first wave, which uh, with exclusive uh, access inside one of New York's hardest hit hospital systems during the first four months of the pandemic. The first wave spotlights the everyday heroes at the epicenter of COVID-19 as they come together to fight one of the greatest threats the world has encountered. And I hope filmmakers in the house, do we have Matthew with us? Matthew Heinemann? Oh. Why people just aren't showing up? Where are you? I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Hello. Thank God someone came to the party. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Matthew. Um, Matthew, congrats on the film. Um, it was a very emotional ride for the audience. And I'm speaking for myself. Um, I suppose my question to you is, uh, how did you come to make a film about COVID-19 during the first wave? And were you aware of the brevity that this pandemic was going to have at that stage? Um, I've got it's a multi uh, pack question here and was fear a part of your daily filming with yourself and the crew did you ever feel like you wanted to back out did it get very scary because I imagine you got very emotionally involved with the people there and your own lives really were at risk because you were on the front line yeah well first of all thank you for for having us here and um yeah I mean it's a terrifying journey for sure it, it, it's in some ways it's sort of a period piece. Um, you know, the, we filmed during the first four months of the pandemic yeah. um, in, in the spring of 2020, and you know, which seems like a far away um, time. And we had no idea, obviously, how long this would last. That we'd still be living with it, you know, years later. Um, you know, our only goal at the time was really to try to take this issue that was so plastered across headlines and. Um, you know, we were reading about and inundated with information about, but we weren't like viscerally, emotionally interacting with it and experiencing. It. And so my 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 goal was to try to put a human face to it and and film a you know very brave group of doctors and nurses um, and patients who are who are under um, you know dealing with this every day. And so we basically embedded it in the hospital and um, yeah, tried to try to humanize it. Well, you really did humanize it. I mean, as someone watching it, it was such an emotional journey being there and going through the nurses and the patients and everyone. I think you did really pulled it off. It was a great film. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Congrats. Um, who do we go to next? Is this Anne? Are you, Anne, are you taking over next? Is it? There we go. It's the time to announce. Okay. I'm, well, I'm very well, happy. I mean, also, sorry, before you do that, did um, did our, our first filmmaker, did he make no, it? No, he was not able to make it, okay. but thank you for Don't checking, worry. Deborah. Okay, I want him to get a shout out anyway. Well, sorry, anyway, go ahead. I have the privilege of um, 
letting you all know who the honorable mention is for documentary film. And it's a film that I hope everybody will see and it's called Young Plato. So congratulations, Mesa and David. It's a wonderful film, love watching it. I want all my children and grandchildren to see it. Oh, Thank that's you. brilliant. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. We're delighted. And we really hope we can get it out widely in, in the US because we've got lots and lots of broadcast sales and in Europe and nothing in the US yet. So we're really- I've got to do it. <laughs> I think this will, this will really help. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Conflict resolution is the greatest thing we can teach our kids. It's evident what the grown-ups are doing. <laughs> Just have to throw that in. Chris, over to you, Chris. Yes, and I have the privilege of announcing the narrative honorable mention, um, which is Casablanca Beats. Uh, congratulations, Clemence. Everything you said is so wonderful, and your best of luck in your, your summer um, you. screenings. And that will help too. So that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Congratulations, guys. Okay. For, okay. So here's the big one. The best social impact film award announcement is it goes to the first wave. Congratulations. <laughs> I was muted. Um, wow. I uh, did not expect that. Um, thank you. We so, love so giving well. you something unexpected. Congre it was really well done. Congratulations. Well, we're we're deeply honored and yeah i think the the film is really as i said i made it for many reasons but i think it's also an homage to the incredible work that nurses and doctors uh that we are we have the privilege of witnessing every single day but they've continued to do you know incredible work um and uh, you know the film is really an homage to them and and you know so i think the award is, is for them really and and but i'm deeply grateful and yeah thank you can I just say congratulations to all the filmmakers? They're all really wonderful. Uh, it's so hard to pick out a, a few, but congratulations to everyone and to Wendy for giving everyone a platform, you know, because we as filmmakers know how hard it is to get films out there into the world. So kudos all around. Congratulations. Thank you to our jury. And uh, we appreciate everybody's time and can't wait to hear what happens with all of these incredible films next. So see you next Thank year, you. I guess. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Congratulations.